I had a disconcerting experience last night. I, I spent a little time with my dentist this week, and she asked me while I was there if, uh, if I had my sermon ready, and I assured her I did. Uh, and I did until I got home and started rereading the material and realized that there's, there's more than one sermon in this passage. And there's at least two of them that need preached right now. Uh, I think there's two great sermons in this passage, and it's kind of too bad you don't have a great preacher. But we are going to study these two streams of thought that stood out to me at least, and there's actually more. There's, uh, there's probably a dozen sermons on the unpardonable sin in Mark chapter 13. We're actually not going to touch that today. I think that's been, you know, dealt with enough by other pastors, but there's a couple things in this passage that I think are rich and just good practical advice for us today. And I want to explore those two streams with you. But first, I'd like to read God's Word. I invite you to join me in Mark chapter 3. We're going to pick up the story in verse 13 and read through the end of the chapter together. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. He goeth up into a mountain and called unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and cast out devils. Simon, he surnamed Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, and James, the son Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him. And they went into a house. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. When his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, He's beside himself. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub. By the prince of devils cast he out devils. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he can't stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he'll first bind the strong man, and then he'll spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because, they said, he had an unclean spirit. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him calling. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother without seek thee, seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? He looked round about on them which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother, and my sister, and my mother. Some ways kind of a difficult passage, isn't it? Jesus dealing here with his earthly family raises a lot of questions in minds at times. The first stream of thought I want to look at with you in this passage starts in verse 21 of the passage. Verse 21. In the King James Version, it says that after Jesus, with his 
his success is being mobbed by the crowds. His friends show up. King James says they come to lay hold on Jesus. Other versions I read this week says they came to seize him. His success has got them thinking that Jesus is losing his marbles. Okay? He's so busy, scripture said here that we just read that he isn't even, he doesn't have time to partake in bread. He's just, people's needs are so pressing that Jesus is working himself to the point where his friends think he's losing his, losing his connection. That there's something wrong, something wrong in Jesus' head. Something pretty similar shows up for us in verses 31 and on. We could say verses, it's verse 32, 31 and 32, where his mother and his brothers come to uh, do essentially the same thing, come to corral Jesus because they feel that he's lost his hold on reality. I think in the textual context, there's probably some reason to believe that the Pharisees have gotten to their thinking. The Pharisees are saying Jesus has a devil. It's by the prince of devils that he's casting out, casting out the devils. But these two parts of this passage have some interesting things in them that I think make a great sermon all by themselves. The first part, the spot where they come to lay hold of Jesus, I think there's some practical things we can learn right there. Jesus ordinarily, when people came to him, he responds, and he does it in a positive manner. He met people where they were, he supplied their needs. I was thinking of different stories. We've already seen some in Mark. We saw him, uh, I think, go out of his way to meet a leper that had a need. And Jesus heals him with a touch. We have the paralytic that Jesus, you know, his friends did let him down through the roof. The man presents with a need and Jesus meets his need. That guy's need is first and foremost that his sins be forgiven. And that Jesus meeting that need has set himself uh, in a dangerous position with the Pharisees. We saw last week that they're, they're looking for reasons to hang Jesus. He's claimed to be able to forgive sin. He's claimed that he's Lord of the Sabbath, which is the same as saying, I'm God the Creator, because to the Jewish mind, that Sabbath goes right back to the creation story. Jesus, though, you know, even though he knows the risk in healing this man, he meets his need, even though it's going to it's going to create problems in his own ministry. He steps up and meets that need. I think of different stories toward the end of Jesus' time on this life. You have the Greeks that show up just before the crucifixion. We would see Jesus. Is it Philip that they, they speak to? And Philip goes and talks to Jesus, and Jesus responds and says, The, the Son of Man is, is being glorified in this. People are being drawn to me. He's on... He's, in the shadow of the cross and you know still meeting people's needs even though his mind had to be on what he was about to endure but this instance we have his friends these people aren't even necessarily acquaintances of jesus in fact we know the greeks weren't the, the paralytic maybe he's from you can say Capernaum had got to be Jesus' secondary hometown in a way, and maybe Christ knew this guy had heard of him. Probably not a, a good acquaintance. The leper has been away from society for who knows how long, and, and Jesus is still responding to these kind of people's needs, to what their requests are. But now his friends come. No indication at all in the Bible that Jesus goes out to deal with them. And his family comes next, and we have no indication that Jesus goes out to deal with them. But it's what they come with that makes the difference. And this is where the lesson gets practical for us. I think there's some times that we want to lay hold on Jesus too, but it's not to hear from Jesus what he'd have us hear. We want him to hear what we have for him. 
you know, we come to Jesus sometimes with our own agenda. His friends came this time because they think he's lost his mind and they want him to cool it. To back off a little bit in this ministry, start, I mean, be realistic, Jesus. If you're going to be king of Israel, you probably ought to find time to eat. You're going to work yourself into a frazzle here and be no good to any of us. You know, and I'm concerned sometimes that we come to Christ also with our own agendas. You know, and you think about the reasons you might come to Jesus. And I'm, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to even pick on our attendance at worship, church time, okay? Coming to church is an important part of a person's Christian walk. I think it's a first step in some ways. It's not the end all, of the be all and end all, or however that's said, but it's an important part of it. But even in the worship service, you know, a person can come for the wrong reason and not encounter Jesus Christ. You know, you see the, the parodies of Christian worship a lot of times, particularly I was thinking about this because of the Easter season. David, what was Easter like in your old hometown in Mississippi? Was Easter a time of great big hats and bonnets in a worship service? It was. The churches had a community gathering together with all churches and uh, had a Sunrise service, like 5.36 in the morning. Uh -huh. I remembered the uh, orange juice and heated donuts afterward. That's probably as strong in my memory as anything else. But there were people in attendance that didn't hardly show up to church any time during the year. There's something about Christmas and Easter that brings some people that have an ounce of a conscience, the morality left in them, have to be in church. Yeah. That's always something amazing to observe. Yeah, sometimes we can come to church for part of what David points out. There's social reasons for coming to church. Okay? Uh, you get to be a Christian that comes to church on Christmas and Easter. It's That's kind of your time of year. You know, these are social gatherings. You come for those. A person could come to church to be seen. I was thinking of that with those... Some of the hats you see at Easter time are really bizarre. You know, that Christians, old Christian ladies like to wear to church. They get the new hat for the Easter service. And you, you want to be seen. But that's not, that's not necessarily going to lead to an encounter with the Lord Jesus. You're coming for the wrong reason. You're coming with your own agenda. David mentioned he remembers the orange juice and the hot donuts. You know, there is a class of Christians we call rice Christians, right? In foreign fields. They come because of the... In Jesus' day, it was the bread and the fish. You know, they came into Christ's presence for that. In our particular fellowship, you know, this little combination here can almost be problematic for us. We have what we call potluck. That's... It's not an unholy reason to come to fellowship with other Christians. But it's not the primary reason to come to Jesus, to come spend time with his people. It doesn't necessarily lead to an encounter with Christ. In fact, sometimes it leads to all kinds of other things. We get in discussions at potluck sometimes, I think, oh my goodness. Uh, and I'm as guilty as anybody on it, you know? We bring the week along with us, and uh, Jesus is not always the focus of everything we do as a body of believers. You know, we can come with the wrong agenda, with the wrong baggage, and Jesus doesn't necessarily meet us even here in the sanctuary. He doesn't respond to people that show up with the wrong plan. Okay, this ties over into his parents. His, I say parents, it doesn't mention Joseph, his earthly father. But his mom and brothers come. Mom and brothers, I mean, this is family. Come. This has been a hard passage for me in some ways because Jesus does ignore them. But his mom and brothers come 
with the wrong agenda also. And there's a key word in that text that I think would make a fantastic sermon. His mom and brothers are without, the Bible says. They're outside, okay? They know about Jesus. I mean, they're, he was raised in that home. They know a lot about Jesus, more than anybody that's inside, wherever they were. But they are without. And that's emphasized in the text two or three times, and it carries over into the next chapter. Jesus has some things to say about the, the blessing that can come from knowing him on a personal level. And when he starts to tell on the parable in the next chapter, which is the parable of the sower, you know, he presents this, we'll probably look at that passage next week. It's a great story, you know. I mean, the sower goes out to sow. Some seed gets spread in the pathway. Some seed falls in the thorns, some into good soil, fortunately, at the the different soils, and the disciples come to him afterwards. Where is it? It's in like chapter 4, uh, verse 10. They come after he's told the parable, and they ask him of the parable, and he says in verse 11, Unto you it's given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are where? Without. That word shows up again unto those that are outside of Christ, that are not in that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, everything's foggy and murky. It's still in parables. He says, unto you, those that he has chosen, those that have the intimate relationship with him, says, I can tell you things plainly, but to those that are without, it's all done in parables. The mom and the brothers are without. Part of understanding Jesus' response to that is to realize that they're without. And it falls in the context in this chapter of Jesus, has just we just read it, Jesus is picking his team. He's picking those that are with him in mission, that see things enough, in, in a similar manner at least, to how he sees things. He's picking those that he can work with his mother and his brothers at this stage in their experience aren't there. They're not part of the team. They're without. And he leaves them without. Now, thank God we know that if this was the only text we had about how Jesus deals with family, I'd question his having lived a perfect life without sin. You know, because it seems disrespectful, doesn't it? But at the cross, what's his dealings with mom? You know, I mean, he's absolutely concerned for her well-being that she be cared for. His brothers, do, do we know that at least one of them came to faith? Two? Yeah, that's right. Jude. Jude is the brother of James. James is the brother of Christ. Both of them prominent in ministry, in propagation of the gospel, that come to faith. So they do join the team, eventually. But this particular term, this without, worries me. Because you know that you could be, I guess we kind of already stressed it, but you could be in church, in fellowship, but without in your relationship to Jesus. You could be on the outside. Everything could still be murky, unclear. The Holy Spirit hasn't really got that avenue he needs to your soul because you're without. You know, to be in Christ Jesus is where the joy is in the Christian walk. It's where things really start to take off and grow for you is when you're in Christ Jesus not without, when you're right there in that fellowship. Somebody's trying to contact us. Huh? I want to encourage you to make sure that you're in Christ Jesus, not without. Nobody can, nobody can look at you necessarily and just say, hey, you know, that person is 
not born again yet, doesn't have Jesus in their heart. But I think individually we have to know that, where we stand with our relationship to Christ Jesus. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If you're still, if things are still fuzzy, if the joy's not there, if you're not 100% sure that Jesus is in your heart where he belongs and that you're in Christ, deal with this fact that you're without and get past it. Because he wants, he wants you in fellowship. He invites you there. That's where he wants a person to be. Okay, that's the first stream of thought I saw in that passage. The second is, I was thinking last night whether there was a, a way to really tie them together. Uh, for me, there really wasn't a real clear way. But the second thing I want to look at is that the company you keep matters. Okay? I think this was, this was the first point where I was going to go. Company matters. It's what I wanted to talk about today. So I really see this in this passage with Jesus. It's set in the context of Jesus choosing his companions. We've stressed that already a little bit. Uh, one of his companions, we think, was kind of chosen for him. You know, Judas is a great prospect. Jesus, sign him up. We studied in the little people's class today how much of a struggle Jesus made for Judas's heart. Now Judas just resisted it. You know, and uh, that was a companion that wasn't 100% on board with what Jesus did for sure. But this particular passage, you know, in verses 24 through 25 in chapter 3, you have Jesus saying that a kingdom that's divided against itself can't stand. Okay, division is counterproductive. No success without unity. Unity is critical in things. I want to talk about this in a practical way for our daily lives, but it applies as well for a church. You know, a church needs at least enough unity to move as a unit to, to move ahead. Division in a church can be a, a disastrous kind of thing. But in your life experiences and in your relationships, this is where the rubber meets the road, I think, for you and me. Division is counterproductive. Jesus says, be ye not what? Be not unequally yoked. We love that verse when we got young people that are contemplating marriage in a church. You know, you tell them, it's, don't you go select an outside the faith. Don't you, a believer with an unbeliever can make a nightmare scenario out of a person's life. Same is true in business, friends. Same is true in the friends you select and the company you keep. You know, people have an enormous influence in our lives. I've come to realize over the years that I have to be really careful of the company I keep because of the influence that people have on me. Negative people, critical people drag me down. You know, it gets, actually, the main thing it produces in me is I get depressed with the whole thing. You know, even sometimes people that we don't know personally, as in watching the news, Dad and I have been watching this past couple weeks, we've been watching Tucker Carlson and Hannity on Fox News a little bit. You wouldn't want to watch too much of that if you don't want to get drugged down, you know? It's, it's entertaining, but they don't see anything positive going on ever in the country, do they? These kind of things are, for a Christian, a dangerous place to be, I think, at times. We have to choose the company we keep, the, the real flesh and blood company, the digital company we keep. Input into this system has an effect on how you're going to live as a Christian. You know, make sure that you're not in division 
because it's counterproductive. Verse 25, I mean, Jesus, if a house be divided against itself, it can't stand. It's not going to prosper unless it's united. That's actually why Jesus had to ignore mom and brothers. You know, they were running cross purposes to where he's headed. He's obeying the Father's will. Mom and brothers come along and they think they've got a clear picture of what Jesus needs. And he says, the agenda you've got right now would just bring me down. He leaves them without, stays with those that see things close to the way he does. Okay, to get very, very real about this, nobody is ever going to find, short of the kingdom of heaven, no group of believers is ever going to find complete unity. And you're never going to be able to find a group of friends where nobody ever brings you down, has a negative thought, or is completely on board with how you see things. Part of the reason for that is possibly because the way I see things and the way you see things may not be necessarily correct. So we learn from each other, but you do want to be united with people in association with people that see things, at least on the spiritual level, largely the same way you do, that love the Lord Jesus Christ, that want to follow him, that want to be in Christ Jesus. Now those, those people, at times, are they going to disappoint you? Yeah. Sometimes you're going to absolutely know that they're in the wrong and things that come along. But be honest, aren't there times where you know you're in the wrong? I know there is for me. I get occasions where it's like, you bumbling idiot, what did you, what did you just do? You know, and why? So I think we can be real with each other on those kind of things, but pick out friends and relationships that build you up. I was thinking about it on the terms of employment in this town. This could be a really difficult thing. You know, we don't have that many options. Okay? I, in my time in Tok, I've plumbed my bars and done some, I've worked for people that were a real bummer. You know, I try not to make them my closest companions. My church family is my closest companions because you guys are on board with you have the same kind of goals. We share a lot in common and build each other up. I had some text I want you to look up. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, oh, that's a terrible 15. 15.33 was one of them. 1 Corinthians 5.6, I bet somebody can quote this for me. A little leaven does what? According to Paul. Let's look them up. It's good to read God's Word. Gosh, actually, I wanted to talk to you about our reading of God's Word. Uh, would it be too Episcopalian and too high church for us to, when we have our scripture reading, to stand when we read? Would that add some respect, I think, to the reading of God's Word? I think I'd like to start doing that, that when we when we have our time where we read from the word that we stand, because usually we have a passage at the start of a sermon where we read God's word. I think we'll, we'll do that next week. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, here I'm, I'm still in Mark. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 tells us that be not deceived. It says evil communications corrupt good manners. In context, Paul is talking about a, a theological dispute, okay, for the Christian church at the time. Same thing could apply today. You know, don't associate yourself with all these fringe things or people will take a little minute point of doctrine at times and just write it to death. Uh, it gets to be evil communication and it corrupts good manners. It disrupts the unity of a church. First Corinthians 5, 6, that's the little leaven. 
leavens the whole lump text, is it not? 1 Corinthians 5, 6. You can look it up and read it. We're going to close here a bit with a text from Psalms where David gives us some advice about the company to keep. But I want to emphasize this just a little bit more through this story in Mark's gospel here. Mark's gospel just says that Jesus went up on a mountain and started calling to those whom he would, and he gave us this list of disciples. He went forth by the sea, you know, and he's drawn all these people to himself, and it's time to choose some disciples. He goeth up on a mountain, calls unto him would he, who he would. Luke's gospel adds a lot to that in chapter 6. Might even be chapter 5. It says that before Jesus chose those disciples, he spent a whole night in prayer. Same thing is mentioned about a mountain. He went out into the mountains and he spent that whole night in prayer. And then he calls his disciples, those that would be his closest associates. That's the Son of God, friends, making that kind of decisions after a whole night of prayer. How much thought do you give to the friendships you make and the associations you make. You know, choose those that'll further your walk with the Lord Jesus to be your closest associates. Don't be keeping companionship with those that would bring you down. Psalms 119, this is our closing text. Psalms 119 and verse 63. David has this to say, and I thought this was awesome advice. Uh, couched as a statement, David could say this was what he had made as a guiding principle in his life. He said, I'm a companion of all them that fear thee, and of them that keep thy precepts. That's who David chose to make as his companions. Have you found, friends, that in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can meet someone that you never knew before. After a little while, your spirit testifies with theirs, and their conversations about the Lord Jesus Christ, you realize that here's a brother, a brother in the Lord, that this is somebody I'm just comfortable with, I could spend all day with. You know, that happens to me. We've had people come to our potlucks and to our fellowship here that, you know, that connection came about and came. it comes fairly quickly because someone else is a lover of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Nathan's parents never met them till they showed up at church here one Sabbath. By the time the day is over, I found another brother and sister in the Lord Jesus Christ. Deeper relationship there than with people I've known for the 30 years I've been in Toke. You know, Choose companions that fear the Lord, them that keep his precepts. Make them your companions. David said, I'm a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Uh, that's the second stream of thought I saw in that passage in Mark, that company matters. Who you hang out with matters, and Jesus models that for us there. That first stream of thought was that proximity to Jesus is not the same as being in Christ, that you can be without while being in. In fellowship, in church, doesn't necessarily mean that you're in Christ. If you find that you're without, that your interest lies with those that detract you from Jesus too, take some advice from this word and, you know, get Jesus where he belongs on the throne of your life. Select friends that will further that walk for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gospel according to Mark, the things we see in it. Uh, Thank you for those stories that are there. Um, it seems to me like Mark makes it awful practical sometimes. I thank you for it. I'd ask that that advice uh, take root in our hearts today, that we make sure Jesus is where he belongs in our relationship. 
and that we're building it where we can by the influences we put in. In Jesus' name, amen.